Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joanne Jones, and I'm a member of the Encore Learning Special Events Committee. And it's my privilege uh, to introduce two highly acclaimed and award-winning filmmakers, Frank and Mary Frost, for documentary so films. We, uh, as we acknowledge that we're celebrating Earth Day this week, Frank and Mary are going to speak to us about their current Labor of Love, a major television documentary on the life and impact of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin on today's ecological movement and concern for our planet, as well as our place in the cosmos. Frank and Mary will share tales of their travels around the globe as they researched Teilhard de Chardin's life and work. And I know that they look forward to having a conversation with you through the questions and answers that you can post in the question and answer box. So for now, we'll turn it over to Mary and Frank and Encore Learning Presents is very happy to have you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And hello, whatever time zone you happen to be in. Thank you, Joanne, for that uh, introduction. It is indeed a labor of love and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone today. So thank you all for joining us and thanks to Encore Learning for bringing us all together. It's especially appropriate to be talking about Tayar today, just a few days before Earth Day. We appreciate your interest in uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and in our upcoming television biography of him called Rediscovering Fire, the Evolution of Teilhard de Chardin. We've been told that many of you may know at least a little and maybe a lot about Teilhard already, and we will not be attempting to tell you his whole story today. We will screen some screen share some slides with you, mostly photos, but sometimes text especially at times when the explanation of Teilhard's ideas need more care in presenting them. We wanna make it easy for you to follow. Uh, other times you'll just see us talking and uh, let me go to screen share right now. We'll be talking about our documentary today, including some behind the scenes stories about the making of it, the story behind the story, so to speak. And here's how we summarize his story in our log line for our documentary. I'll give you a few seconds to read it on your own. So Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a pious French boy homeschooled in literature and religion by his mother and the secrets of flora and fauna by his father. And he grew up to become a spiritual and scientific visionary with a cosmic perspective. He turned his love for God and his passion for the earth into two professions, a Jesuit priest and a geologist. We describe Teilhard as a clerical Indiana Jones, an adventurer geologist, and as a 20th century Galileo, an independent thinker exiled for trying to bring his church into a world that embraces huh. science. Although he was not allowed to publish religious articles in his lifetime, he nevertheless wrote prolifically. His works published after his death in 1955 exploded onto the world scene in the late 50s and in the early 60s in the US and became bestsellers in every major language around the world. Many of you may remember what was going on in the early 60s. The Beatles, hippies, new ways of thinking, the Second Vatican Council and the Catholic Church. Those times filled with the excitement of change may give you a hint as to the reason his exuberant, hopeful, paradigm-shifting view of spirituality caught on with Christians and non-Christians alike. I imagine a fair number of you are familiar with his most famous books, The Divine Milieu and the Phenomenon of Man, the new title of which for a revised translation is The Human Phenomenon. So what do we know about Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, apart from the fact that he was fourth of 11 children and that his great great grandmother was an aunt of Voltaire? We have plenty of contemporaneous testimonials that describe him as an adult. Pierre Teilhard was a lean patrician priest, wrote one, a jagged visaged aristocrat, rough cast in bronze. He had a striking face and dark penetrating gaze. There was a lively twinkle in his eye, wrote another. Humor too, but no hint of irony. On subjects that moved him, he spoke with vivacity and animation. He was a fascinating talker. 
his words went straight to your soul. That Teilhard was a passionate man is evident in his language and also in his, his insistence that we have a, must have a zest for life. He repeatedly invoked the image of fire. The world gradually caught fire for me, burst into flames, he wrote. It formed a great luminous mass lit from within that surrounded me. So you may think of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin as an inspired religious philosopher. Most people who know of him do, and that's not incorrect, but he was also a world-class geologist and paleontologist, as evidenced by 11 volumes of scientific writings. Based on, the, <clears throat> based on the large number of inspiring quotes to be found on the internet, you'd think that his life was one continuous inspiration, mm -hmm. but and if you Google Teilhard de Chardin quotes, you will get nearly 300,000 results. Among them, you'll find four things he found most important. The ability to see, the importance of love, our common humanity, and evolution as a bedrock of everything. But in fact, Teilhard's life is <clears throat> one of struggle, the internal struggles that started very early struggle with a learned tension between love of the world and love of God. Physical and psychological struggles facing imminent death during 67 battles over four and a half years in World War I. Struggles of obedience with Jesuit authorities and a lifelong struggle to make sense of divine and human love. And this is the fascinating story that Mary and I set out to tell in a two hour, two hour television biography destined for public television. We knew from the beginning that we didn't just want to do a recitation of the facts of his life. A couple of excellent French filmmakers have already done that. We want to capture the drama of his life, the struggles and triumphs that biographers so seldom talked about. To do that, our television show would have to be longer than an hour. And since the programming patterns of PBS rarely allow for 90 minute programs, we gravitated to a two hour show. Even at that, we know we'll need to be disciplined in our editing. His story is so replete with fascinating characters and details. And what we propose to do today is to tell you about four key moments in his life and some lesser known details of those moments. And parallel to that, to give you a glimpse beyond, behind the scenes of what it has taken us to get this production this far. It's especially appropriate to be talking about Teilhard de Chardin today because in just three days we'll be celebrating Earth Day 2021. Teilhard had a deep love of the earth, a passion so strong that at one time as a new Jesuit, he wondered if he was giving God his due and whether he needed to give up his geological passions to focus only on God. As he expressed it in his first spiritual essay, written in the trenches of the First World War, I write these lines to express a passionate vision of the earth and to search for a solution to the doubts of my activity because I love the universe, its energies, its secrets, its hopes, and because at the same time I am devoted to God, <clears throat> the only origin, the only end. You might wonder why Teilhard felt such doubts of his activity, but you have to realize that he had been formed as a young Jesuit by the spiritual teachings of Thomas Akempis who wrote a classic treatise called The Imitation of Christ that all new Jesuits were required to read and reread. Akempis taught that to become holy, we must turn away from the world. You can readily see that contempt of the world is a far cry from Teilhard's love of the universe, its energies, its secrets, its hopes. A spiritual director assures Teilhard that he can find and love God through the earth and that he need not be afraid of that passion. But still this tension wears at him for some years until he arrives at his big aha of evolution. With that insight, he comes to understand that everything in the cosmos is constantly emerging, becoming something new. The word he used is Genesis. And God is present in everything and is in fact the very energy of evolution. God is working through evolution in the creation of everything, what Teilhard called cosmogenesis. And Teilhard would later write, there is communion with God, there is, there is communion with God, there is communion with the earth, and there is communion with God through the earth. Nothing in this world, he concluded, is profane to those who have the eyes to see.
Teilhard's notion of the sacredness of creation and the unity of all things joined in his mind with the fact that once human consciousness emerged, we humans have become participants in evolution and are responsible for it. As his paleontology colleague in China, Helmut de Terra later wrote about Teilhard, the earth was his laboratory. And that insight of our responsibility for evolution for our planet inspired another later American priest, Thomas Berry, to apply Teilhard's vision to ecology, to our nurture of the earth as our human mission. Barry spoke of this as the great work of ecological restoration and environmental education we recognize today. Barry is one of the leaders who helped start international celebrations of Earth Day, which this year we celebrate starting just three days from now. We encourage you to go to earthday.org and select the tab Earth Day 2021. There you'll find a long list of practical actions you can take to help preserve and restore our planet Earth. Now, any major documentary is a complex undertaking. It requires thoroughly re researching the story and figuring out how to tell it. It means raising substantial funding. It involves seeking out and engaging numerous experts. It demands a host of logistical challenges. Making this documentary in particular has been an adventure. It has created its own story filled with discoveries, overflowing with serendipity, or depending on your point of view, a host of little miracles. We thought we knew about Teilhard when we started, but we had no idea just how interesting a life he had lived, nor what we would turn up as we proceeded. The devil's in the details, yes, but often delight can also be in the details. So we started with what we had on hand. Two Georgetown University libraries have valuable Teilhard resources. The Special Collections Library has extensive collections of Teilhard's letters and original essays. It seems like everyone he ever wrote to saved his letters. And the Woodstock Theological Library has even more. So here's an early bit of serendipity. Soon after we started our research, Mary and I drove from Northern Virginia to Baltimore to uh, seek information from Father Jim Salmon, a Jesuit who was well-versed in Teilhard. Father Salmon brought with him to the meeting a woman named Nicole schmitz Mormon. Nicole had, with her late husband Carl, edited all of Teilhard's scientific works in 10 volumes that we showed you before, plus a volume of maps. The Schmitz Mormon collection records are in Georgetown's Woodstock Library. Nicole, French by birth, had also spent years transcribing Teilhard's tiny handwriting in the journals that he had kept throughout his life. Nicole, who turned out to be one of the most knowledgeable people about Teilhard on the planet, apart from her, Teilhard's family, was instantly on board with our project, and her collaboration has been invaluable. At the same time, we caught an early break that arose from doing research in the Special Collections Library at Georgetown. I wanted to make copies of very interesting letters I found there. I was told that before I could do that, I would need the permission of the Teilhard family in France. I asked how I could get in touch with them and was given an email address for Marie Bayon de Latour, a great niece of Teilhard, who was also the executive director of the Teilhard Family Association in Paris. So we wrote to Marie, sent her a summary of our proposed documentary, and asked for permission to copy documents for research purposes. For several months, we heard nothing. In the meantime, Mary and I had met John Grimm, the president of the American Teilhard Association, at a conference in California. A few months later, we attended an American Teilhard Association meeting in New York, and there John introduced us to a woman named Tracy Higgins. Tracy had lived in Paris for a number of years and had gotten to know the Teilhard family while she was there. Tracy and we hit it off and she wanted to be part of the project. A few days after that meeting, we finally got an email response from Marie Bayon de la Tour. She had circulated our proposal, she wrote, to her family members, and they had decided that they would cooperate with the project. They only had one condition, they wanted us to agree to work closely with a woman they knew in the U.S. named Tracy Higgins. And as we proceed in this story, you'll see how essential this became. We mentioned earlier that Teilhard's life was shaped by struggles and that we would talk about four key moments of struggle in his life. The first key moment took place during his early childhood in the south central mountainous area of France called Auvergne. Teilhard in his spiritual autobiography, written late in his life, describes his first memory. 
I was five or six, he writes. He was sitting near the fireplace that warmed the room. My mother had snipped off a few of my curls. I picked one up and held it close to the fire. The hair was burnt up in a fraction of a second. A terrible grief assailed me. I had learned that I was perishable. So what did he do? He sought out things he thought were non-perishable, especially items made of iron. He called them his iron gods. In the country, there was the lock pin of a plow, which I used to hide carefully in a corner of the yard. With that plow hitch, I believed myself rich with a treasure incorruptible, everlasting. And then it turned out that what I possessed was just a bit of iron that rusted. At this discovery, I threw myself on the lawn and shed the bitterest tears of my existence. How amazing that the five-year-old in this picture could have had such advanced awareness. The seeds of a mystic were, present, were present very early in him, and thus Teilhard launched a lifetime of searching for the indestructible, the lasting, the permanent. This was a time in Teilhard's life when he was homeschooled by his mother in religion and by his father in studying nature. It was the time about which Teilhard wrote, Auvergne molded me. Auvergne gave me my first taste of the joys of discovery. To Auvergne I owe my delight in nature. Mary and I really felt we had to get the story of Teilhard's childhood and youthful formation right. But without actually seeing the house he lived in or the mountains and valleys he roamed in, it was hard to imagine how to treat this visually on film. Thank goodness we had a special resource, Marie Bayonne de Latour. We had struck up a correspondence with Marie after she agreed to our research request. I wrote to her in English and she wrote to me in French. I understood school book French, but had not learned it as a spoken language. Marie soon followed up with a suggestion to fully understand her great uncle, Père Teilhard, meaning Father Teilhard, it would really be necessary to walk in his footsteps. And to that end, she offered to host us on a visit to the Auvergne region in France, where the young Pierre grew up. Of course, we enthusiastically said yes even with the awareness that we were hardly in any financial position yet to do so. This was in the fall. Trusting in Providence and making a special financial appeal to our growing list of backers for help, we agreed to join her the following June. As we scurried to find funds, we awaited further direction from Marie. But several months passed without a word. We began to get anxious about where we were going, how long we would be there and where we would stay. So we wrote to Marie and asked her where we should plan on staying while we were there. She wrote back that we would stay at Mirol. So we went to Google Maps to look up Mirol. Sure enough, not far from Clermont-Ferrand, the capital city of the Auvergne region, was a small picturesque town of Mirol tucked into steep volcanic hillsides. The Tourist Bureau listed only a few hotels there, as I remember, and we thought it would be wise to get Marie's advice as to which hotel would be our best bet. We soon got a letter back that surprised us and made us realize that our understanding of the nuances of her French was not as good as we thought, and it was clear she was upset. Her letter began, remember she wrote in French, I am in the process of completing the program that I'm going to give you, and I am distressed by your email. She went on to say that making arrangements was far from easy for her. Whoa, this was not a good start. This was a case for our new friend, Tracy Higgins. We forwarded the email to Tracy and called her on the phone and asked her to telephone Marie in France and talk to her directly to help sort things out. The next day, Tracy called back after talking to Marie. Well, context is everything. Mirol, it turns out, is a town, yes but it's also the name of one of the three chateaus that remain in the Teilhard de Chardin family. And that was the Mirol that Marie was referring to. And she could not understand our ingratitude in wanting to go to a hotel, particularly since she had had to persuade the owner of her Mirol to let us come there and take pictures. It was then that Marie persuaded Tracy to accompany us on our trip to France to act as translator and intercultural buffer. And Tracy was a huge help. Having arrived at Mirol, Marie's uncle, Régis Teilhard de Chardin, Père Teilhard's nephew, was a gracious host. We got along famously, despite the fact that he spoke no English and our French was very limited. 
the role we learned had played an important role in the life of Tayar as a young boy. It was situated on the banks of the Allier River. Those banks were covered with stones that washed down from the mountains and young Pierre would go there to collect special stones and to break some of them with a geologist's hammer in hopes of finding fossils. Marie Bayonne, seen here, took us down to the Allier to demonstrate the search that is still a strong tradition with her cousins in the family. A second family chateau is named Les Moulins. Visiting Les Moulins was easier for Marie to plan since her father, Henri de Pazage, Teilhard's nephew-in-law, owned the house. Henri could not have been more welcoming. What's more, he spoke good English that he had learned while working for an oil company in San Francisco in his younger years. We found out that Les Moulins was the place Teilhard went for his summer retreat and rest for a month each year in the late 1940s for the three years between his return from China after World War II and his second exile to the U.S. in 1950. Henri had vivid memories of Uncle Pierre staying at the house and saying mass in the built-in chapel. The second story room where Teilhard spent many hours writing letters and essays is still preserved the way it was when Teilhard resided there. It was from Les Moulins that Teilhard would depart to visit Rome and meet with the Jesuit Father General to discuss the books that were being denied publication, including the divine milieu and the human phenomenon. Henri took Teilhard to the train station and picked him up a month later when he returned. When Teilhard was asked how it went, his response was that there are too many priests and nuns in Rome, meaning they were all speaking against him. Henri was able to tell us many wonderful stories of those times. He was 90 years old when we met him, and we were able to film a sit-down formal interview three years later, just months before he died. Sarsana is the name of the family estate where Teilhard was born. Here, Teilhard's niece, Isabel, who owns Sarsana, was more cautious about letting us visit, not wanting photos to be taken at the time of our research trip. But just a few years later, when we returned to shoot, Isabel and her family, who were visiting for a summer vacation, could not have been more gracious, giving us the run of the house to film. The year before he died, Teilhard returned from New York to visit Sarsana, accompanied by his close Jesuit friend, Pierre Loire. Loire later related that as they walked down the halls of the three-storied Sarsana, Teilhard hardly said a word. But when they got to the open doorway at the end of the second floor corridor, he said, this is the room where I was born. It was his mother's bedroom. During our visit to Auvergne, Teilhard came truly alive for us. Not only did we learn innumerable details that we would not find in books, but we got a sense of what he meant when he later wrote that, Teilhard, that uh, Auvergne shaped him. The soaring arches of the Clermont-Ferrand Cathedral with its rushed, hushed sounds and burning candles would certainly have impressed his young imagination. But no more than the arching trees reaching for the heavens he relished in the world of nature. We visited the little church where his mother went to mass daily and saw the baptismal font where he was baptized as a baby. As we walked the paths around Sarsana where the child Pierre walked in the luxuriant mountainside, we could begin to understand his passion for the earth, for nature, for stones. There's a family story of the time when young Pierre, maybe eight years old, disappeared one day in the company of his cousin Marguerite, the same age as he, whose family was visiting from Clermont-Ferrand. The two families noticed that the two children were missing and after some hours became frantic in searching for them. Pierre and Marguerite, it turned out, had decided to climb to the top of the volcanic mountain nearby called the Puy de Pariu. When we heard this story, we readily agreed to climb the mountain ourselves with Marie and Tracy. It was not as easy as we had expected. Not only was the mountain steeper than we thought and higher, but we had not come prepared with the proper clothes, especially shoes. While Marie and Tracy wore hiking shoes, we were wearing regular street shoes. And on top of that, it had rained the night before and the muddy path was slick, particularly with our smooth soles. My shoes were particularly bad, and for every one step forward, it seemed I would slide two steps back. We urged Marie and Tracy to go on ahead, and eventually we lost sight of them. But there was no way we could turn back, knowing that Marie's plan was to return by another route. 
But when we reached the top and rejoined them, it was worth it with Claremont Ferrand visible in the distance. You can see the bowl at the top of the mountain, typical of dormant volcanoes. The day we were there, a school group was having a field trip. We don't have time in today's presentation to cover all the sites we visited, but the small miracles we referred to applied especially to two other places, Hastings, England, and China. When Thierry was still a Jesuit novice, a French sec secularization law caused the Jesuits to leave France and they set up a school of theology in Hastings, England. So when the time came for Teilhard to study theology, specifically to prepare for the priesthood, he spent four years there and was ordained there. Share that. This was a pivotal moment in his life. Hastings was an ideal place for Teilhard to pursue his interest in geology and nature. He immediately begins to explore the area and writes home, naturally, one of the first preoccupations was to see what the countryside had to offer. Geologically speaking, this is a lower Cretaceous area, approximately 120 million years old marked by chalky soil, the extinction of dinosaurs, the development of early mammals and flowering plants, and I've already spotted a few fossils. Within walking distance of the seminary were, were, were dramatic seaside cliffs that were rich with fossils. He would use every Thursday he could, Thursday was their day free for classes, exploring the rocky beach at the foot of the cliffs. The tides were very dangerous, go back, uh, when they were high, only allowed access to the beach for a limited period. During his times at Hastings, his goal to pursue geology professionally became firm. Hastings was also significant to Teilhard's interior journey. Remember, he was determined to resolve that inner conflict that had arisen in his early training between his dedication to God and his passion for the earth. His love for the earth had led him to learn all he could about evolution. Teilhard had read Darwin, but he was less interested in the evolution of species than he was in the evolution of the cosmos from its first moment, what we now call the Big Bang, to the emergence of human consciousness and beyond. And his under search for understanding was complicated by his determination to synchronize or synthesize evolution with his faith in Christ. So Jesuit training in the first decade of the 20th century required three years of theology studies leading up to priestly ordination followed by a fourth year of theology. In his third year, shortly before ordination, Teilhard had his big aha about evolution. He saw how it all, everything fit together and it exhilarated him. He had finally found the key to the incorruptible and everlasting that he was seeking. Teilhard saw humans as being the peak of evolution, but for him, the key was understanding that all of evolution has been and is the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of spirit. And as part of that insight, he realized that earth and spirit are not two things, but one. All matter, he theorized, is one stuff, both matter and spirit, no matter how inner we perceive the elements to be. Everything has two aspects, both an inside and an outside. The inside is spirit, the outside is material. And when evolution reaches the level of human life, that inner dimension of spirit becomes what we know as consciousness, which brings with it the qualities of freedom and capacity for love. And with those qualities, we have become empowered to be co-creators of evolution. And henceforth, we have some responsibility for. A natural conclusion of Teilhard's way of seeing the world is that we are all one. We all come from the same source. Combine that notion with the responsibility that we, we now have for evolution, and you, would, and you will find the seeds of an ecological vision. One writer sums it up in terms of love. Love, by the way, is considered by Teilhard to be the primary energy of the cosmos. He defines love as the internal propensity to unite and applies it to the force that unites atoms and bonds the universe, but takes its most evolved form in human consciousness. 
Love alone is capable of uniting living beings in such a way as to complete and fulfill them, for it alone takes them and joins them by what is deepest in themselves. All we need is to imagine our ability to love developing until it embraces the totality of humanity and the earth. It's noteworthy that even though Teilhard's work was completed before the environmental movement emerged, in this statement, love extends to the whole earth community, to both people and ecosystems. As Thomas Berry has written, Teilhard saw how our modern scientific age has enabled us to create our own sacred story, the epic of evolution, telling us from empirical observation and critical analysis how the universe came to be, the sequence of its formation, transformations down through some billions of years, how our solar system came into being, then how the earth took shape and brought us into existence. Not a bad thought for Earth Day. Obviously, Hastings was a place we knew we had to shoot, but unlike Auvergne, we were starting without a contact there. By good fortune, we learned of a former Jesuit who now lived in Hastings. I immediately wrote to him for advice. Unfortunately, this gentleman was going to be out of the country at the time we needed to be in Hastings for research, but he introduced us to an amateur geologist, very knowledgeable about Teilhard, who agreed to help. Not only did Ken Brooks help us book housing, he and his wife took three days to introduce us to the area. The most important location was the cliffs of Pet Level, where Teilhard and a fellow Jesuit would scavenge for fossils. We learned a couple of important things from Ken. As folks unschooled in geology, we always had thought that when the book said Teilhard collected fossils, he just discovered them lying on the ground. Ken set us straight. Teilhard had learned to recognize which type of rock was fossiliferous, and virtually every fossil Teilhard found there he discovered by taking a promising stone and breaking it open. Once in a great while, that, that stone would yield a fossil trapped in it for some 140 million years. Some of the fossils and stones Teilhard and a fellow Jesuit collected are still found in the Hastings Museum in a cigar box that Teilhard decorated with an American flag and lined with a former theology exam paper. The other important thing we learned from Ken, no, a critical thing, is that access to the cliffs is limited to a few hours each day due to the tides, and only a few of those days each month occurred in daylight, which was necessary for filming. It was simply too dangerous to get trapped under the cliffs at high tide. Now, after our research trip to Hastings, it would be another five years before we would raise the money sufficient to return to shoot. We stayed in touch with Ken in the meantime, but when the time finally came and I wrote to Ken to coordinate schedules, we did not hear back from him. After emailing him several times and waiting anxiously, we still heard nothing. <laughs> Timing had become critical because we needed to coordinate our shooting at Hastings with shooting in Paris at the National Museum of Natural History. And it turned out that the museum only allowed shooting on two Tuesdays a month and national holidays that year effectively limited to, to one Tuesday a month. While that may not seem too complicated, we had to know the tide tables in order to know on what days we could shoot in Hastings that would allow us to arrive in Paris on the single Tuesday we could shoot there. You'd think that in this day and age, tide tables would be on the web. They are, but only a month in advance. With time drawing short, we wrote to Ed Eklund, the former Jesuit who had first introduced us to Ken. We learned that Ken's wife had died a few months earlier and he was so bereft that he was not able to respond. So Ed's wife, drove into Hastings to buy the annual Tide Tables in a booklet and mailed that booklet to us, another unexpected gift. We were now in a position to plan, but we had counted so heavily on Ken's ability to make arrangements for us that he, in Hastings that we felt like we were flying blind. With our proposed shooting period just a few months away, one day we received an unexpected email. A British woman wrote that she had read about our documentary and she was devoted to Tayar. She wanted to know if there's anything she could do to help us. She said she had had some previous experience in television. We, of course, wrote right back to her and told her we would be shooting in Hastings. Georgina Dean answered immediately that she lived just 40 minutes from Hastings and would be delighted to become our local production manager. Also, her husband mm -hmm. was a geologist. If you can believe in miracles, you can believe in this one. Georgina was absolutely first rate at organization and made our visit there extremely productive. Without, their, without her, we don't know how we would have pulled it off. 
So Mary was now able to schedule a time in Hastings that would allow us also to shoot in Paris on the one Tuesday of the month it was allowed. This in turn would not have been possible without the help and intervention of a French woman, Marie Reltienne, living at that time in Paris, who we had hired years before to play a voice role in a documentary when she lived here in Washington, DC. The woman at the museum in charge of media shoots was form formidable and unbending in her demands and we learned of new rules frequently. So we really needed Marie. At the last minute, we thought all was set. We learned um, that we would need a very large and expensive insurance policy to shoot and we were financially maxed out. Our friend Marie was able to make our case forcefully in French to make the shoot possible. The vast number of things that can go wrong on a location shoot inspire fear in the best of situations. But both in Hastings and in Paris, we felt like an angel came to our rescue. China is immensely significant in Teilhard's life. He spent half his adult life there. He made his first trip there in 1923 at the invitation of a fellow Jesuit, Emile Lassant. Lassant had already been excavating for fossils for almost a decade at that point and had a museum in Tianjin on the coast due east of Peking. During that year and a half visit to China, Teilhard was in high spirits, writing letters to not only Marguerite, but to his other friends in Paris. On that trip, he finished a mystical essay in the Ordos Desert he had started during the war, which he called Mass on the World. After returning to France, he would soon sail back to China banished there by Jesuit superiors to silence his voice on the topic of evolution in the church. But instead of gaining anonymity there, he became world famous as part of the geological team that discovered Peking Man. Peking Man was the name given to the most famous early human fossils found up to that point. Although the discoverers determined that the Peking man fossils were actually that of a female and privately called her Nellie. <laughs> it was in China that Teilhard wrote both the divine milieu and the human phenomenon. Teilhard was well known and respected internationally. He was invited on expeditions with the famous American explorer, explorer Roy Chapman Andrews, who was the real life inspiration for Indiana Jones. And he joined the French team of the extraordinary yellow crossing sponsored by the automaker Citroen to demonstrate all-terrain vehicles, including the predecessor of 20th, 20th century military tanks. It was also during this time that he became close friends with Lucille Swan, an American sculptor visiting China who became responsible for sculpting the likeness of Peking Man and who became his sounding board and collaborator on the human phenomenon. Some 23 years of letters between Teilhard and Lucille that have been published reveal a deep and sometimes difficult relationship. All of this we knew about Teilhard's China history, but when, we came, when it came to filming, we didn't know where to begin. We did have some starting points. We knew we wanted to shoot in Beijing, at Jukudian, the site where Peking Man was discovered, and in the Ordos Desert, where Teilhard wrote The Mass on the World. Georgetown University had an institution called the Beijing Center for foreign students to learn Chinese. We arranged housing there, Early on in our research, we had been introduced by one of our scholars to a Chinese paleontologist who speaks English and who spends half of each year in Canada. Hailu Yu accepted our invitation to be on our Council of Scholars. We timed our visit to Beijing for the window of time when he would be in China and in Beijing and not in the field. So off we went to China with at least a place to stay and someone to consult in Beijing. Our English speaking contact at the Beijing Center had sent us the uh, housing address in Chinese characters that she said we would show to, should show to the China taxi driver. That worked well, although when you get dropped off at the entrance to a large university after dark on a Saturday night after mm -hmm. a 13-hour flight, it can be a challenge to find the proper building for registration. Sometime later, we dragged our bags up five flights to our room, tired but optimistic. Haile Yu is a senior researcher at the IVPP, the Institute for the Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology of the Chinese Academy of Science. We had an appointment to see him on Monday morning at nine. 
After checking out the maps, both city maps and subway maps, we decided to make a trial run of the journey for the first time on Sunday when we could avoid time pressures and could afford to get lost. We were conveniently located a 15 minute walk between two subway lines. We made our choice of subway stations and set out. To do a trial run was very smart, but Sunday traffic on the subway turned out to be nearly as bad as weekday rush hour. Although we had to change trains twice and never had a chance to sit down, we were relieved to see that every station stop was written in English letters as well as Chinese characters, and the very modern trains had LED maps that always made it clear where you were. We also had the chance to learn a very valuable lesson. The crush of people getting in and off the train at each stop did not leave room for politeness. When we got to one station where we needed to change trains, I charged ahead to get off. <laughs> Mary unfortunately was being polite and allowing people to go ahead of her. Mm -hmm. With a push of people boarding, Mary never would have gotten off if I had not had a hold of her wrist and literally dragged her out before the door closed. <laughs> but thanks to that adventure, we were able to be on time the next morning for our meeting with Hai Lu Yu. <laughs> we were in for a surprise. In none of our conversations with Teilhard scholars, including the Teilhard family, had we learned of the immense stature Teilhard enjoys in modern day China. After a brief conversation with Hai Lu Yu, he took us to meet a couple of other people. One of those was the director of the IVPP, Gao Jing. This was no mere formality, it turned out. Gao Jing had written a book about a major paleontological site in Inner Mongolia called Shui Donggu that Teilhard had discovered 90 years before. Gao Jing gave us a copy of the book and insisted that we visit the site, arranging to have a high-ranking official of the region host us. Gao Jing then took us down the hall to meet Hu Yamei. She had a poster of Teilhard on the wall of her office that she had picked up at a conference in France. Her special area of expertise was digs in the Ordos Desert, and she was able to set up arrangements for us to visit Salawusu, which Teilhard had called Shara Asogol. And once again, a high-ranking official would host us. We were accompanied there by Bai Ching Wan, who had written the history of Salawusu and who could tell us every detail of Teilhard's time there, down to the tree under which he and Emile Lissant camped when they first arrived. The other person you see in the picture with Mr. Bai is our friend, Father Jerry Martinson, a Jesuit priest and television producer who lived in Taiwan for 40 years and spoke fluent Mandarin. He was our interpreter and also introduced us to Cindy Zheng, who we hired as our production manager in China. China was far and away the most complicated location for shooting and Cindy was another miracle worker. The IVPP also arranged for us to visit a third location called Niyuan, which is not mentioned in most Teilhard literature, but which is today the most famous paleontological site in China called the home of early man. A huge bust of Teilhard overlooks the vast valley of mountainous folds of desert. But the most dramatic statement of respect for Teilhard was the first place we stopped, Shui Donggu. They tell the story there of how Teilhard and Lissant, after six weeks of travel with their caravan of donkeys on their way to the Ordos and sleeping in the open air, Late one evening happened upon a small inn for travelers. The tale is dramatized in a diorama with life-size wax statues. The travelers gratefully took advantage of the hospitality offered. The next morning, they looked out from the window of their room to see red cliffs a hundred yards away that almost certainly contained fossils, and quick examination proved that judgment correct. They delayed their trip to the Ordos for a week to dig there, ending up with 16 crates of fossils. In addition to the diorama telling Teilhard's story, there is a large bust of him also standing in front of the reconstructed inn. The last key moment in Teilhard's life that we'll touch on briefly was a crisis of obedience that would totally change the arc of his life. This drama occurred at roughly the midpoint of Teilhard's life. Uh, he had entered the Jesuits as a teenager, had his great epiphany regarding evolution, and had been ordained by age 30. He spent two years doing geology studies before he was called up to military service. After the war, he completed his doctorate in geology to great acclaim. Now a shooting star in the scientific field, he was at the age of 40 named professor of geology at the Institut Catholique in Paris. We knew we needed to shoot there. 
We were well received at the Institute and were given access to documents and letters of by and about Tayar. These were to help us understand the drama that would soon totally change his life. As a young professor, Tayar was very popular with students and at intellectual salons in Paris to which he was invited, thanks to his cousin Marguerite, his childhood companion hiking up the Puy de Paris, who is now headmistress of an exclusive girls' school in Paris. Young Jesuits in training also loved Teilhard. He was an enthusiastic apostle of evolution and of what the understanding of evolution can do to open up our horizons and worldview. He was not so popular among some older Jesuits. One day after delivering a lecture to some Jesuits studying theology in Belgium, a faculty member present had a question for him. If what you say about evolution is true, Father, he said, then it would seem that Adam and Eve were not real people. And if that is true, what happens to the church's doctrine on original sin? Well, Teilhard must have had thoughts along this line himself because he was able to give an answer, reframing original sin in the light of scientific thinking. But he himself was not fully satisfied with his own answer. And so he said he would give it further thought and would write a paper about it. It had been Teilhard's mode of operation for years and would continue to be until his death that when he wanted to think through something, he would write a paper about it. In this case, he came up with three alternative ways of thinking about original sin and sent a paper of his copy of his paper to a couple of trusted Jesuit friends for their reaction. In the meantime, this is 1922 we're talking about, he had accepted the offer he'd earlier received from Emile Lisson in China to accompany him on the paleontological expedition we talked of previously. He believed it would be good experience to inform his teaching and may, may have thought it would have the added advantage of decreasing the heat he felt coming from the older Jesuits opposed to evolution. So he finished his essay before he left for China, left it in his desk drawer when he set sail, and that proved to be a serious mistake. A year and a half later, when Teilhard was aboard ship sailing back to France, the Jesuit Father General in Rome was writing a letter to Teilhard's provincial superior, Costa de Beauregard. I am writing about a serious matter with regard to Father Teilhard de Chardin, it begins. He explains that he has received from an unnamed source a paper explaining original sin in the light of modern science, unsigned, but attributed to Father Teilhard. He has had the paper reviewed by theologians who condemn it as not conforming to accepted church doctrine. So he gives directions to Costa de Beauregard. Number one, he is to give Father Teilhard the chance to deny he wrote it. He deserves the chance to defend himself. If he does, does say he wrote it, ask him to recant. If he wrote it, he must declare in writing that he will not speak publicly or publish anything contrary to the church's teaching in the future. But if he persists, he will be expelled from the Jesuits. Teilhard is hardly back in Paris at the Institut Catholique when he is summoned by Costa de Beauregard. Faced with the options he has given, Teilhard feels he cannot in good conscience agree to what is demanded of him. He has no trouble assenting to church doctrine because these are based on moral theory, but he cannot deny what science tells him about evolution. So he attempts to negotiate. He makes the case that what he wrote was never meant for publication, but was only a way to engage a few theologians in conversation. Negotiation just leads to further demands. Teilhard is forbidden to speak publicly or publish anything of a religious nature. He must restrict himself to writing scientific papers. He will no longer be allowed to teach, and he is withdrawn from the faculty of the Institut Catholique over the objections of the Institute's rector. Furthermore, he will be missioned, that is, exiled indefinitely to China, where his voice will not be heard. Teilhard's only alternative to accepting these conditions is to choose to leave the Jesuits. After months of ag anguish and consultations with close friends, he finally accepts the general's demands and remains a Jesuit. Of course, it's a great irony that within three years, Teilhard would be a member of a Chinese geological team responsible for the discovery of Peking Man, the greatest anthropological find of the century up to then. Teilhard is the third from the right. He would be propelled into an international celebrity, 
traveling the world to explain the significance of Peking man and evolution. Teyar will remain in China for a total of 23 years. He is finally forced to leave by the Chinese after World War II and returns to France for a few years before he is sent into a second exile to New York City, where he dies five years later. He is buried in Hyde Park, New York. All the books and articles he has been prevented from publishing during his life were published immediately after his death. So where are we in our production? We have finished 40 days of international shooting and most of the 20 or so interviews of experts who help us tell the story. We've acquired almost 200 hours of footage and 800 pages of interview transcripts and have begun the time intensive post-production process, <clears throat> which includes not only editing, but researching and acquiring archival footage, casting and recording character voices and narration, sound design and sound mix, music score composition, color correction, and technical requirements for broadcast. What we've shared with you are a few of the critical moments in Teilhard's life, along with some challenges with moments of serendipity or miracles to overcome them that we face in the making of this television program. There's always more to tell, of course, but I think that is best done by answering any questions you may have. Yes, we welcome any questions you have. Okay, we're, yeah, if you can, well, let me start sharing. <laughs> we're in the Q&A session, so, um, but we have a, a couple of events that are that are coming up that I need to talk about. Um, let me go ahead. Okay, before we get to Q&A, if you want to start entering some questions, go ahead. Uh, we have a couple of events coming up there. One is on May 3rd. Uh, we have the visionary landscape architecture of Frederick Olmsted, who did the, uh, uh, the U.S. Capitol grounds. That's on May 3rd. And also on May 17th, we learn about the U.S. Uh, Army, uh, the Army Art and History Preserved at the Fort Belvoir Museum. So with that, I'm going to get into, uh, stop sharing and start getting into the questions. Um, okay, one question is that, uh, how does the Chardin's thinking uh, relate to spiritual thinking by Native Americans? Before I answer that, um, I don't mean to be critical, but I, I need to say for the record that uh, his name is not Deschardins. Okay. Deschardins is a qualifier for his name, which is Teilhard. Teilhard. Okay. I'm sorry. Teilhard. <laughs> um, so My mistake. <laughs> could you repeat that question about how the... Uh, how does uh, Teilhard's thinking relate to the spiritual thinking by Native Americans? I'm not an expert in that, but I'm told, particularly, uh, this, by the way, is a, a specialty of John Grimm, the president of the American Teilhard Association. Um, but I'm told that the, uh, it, it, it runs very close to the same. He, did, of course, himself was not aware of those traditions, but those traditions closely relate to the, uh, to the way of thinking of Teilhard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, I see you're using the, what kind of, uh, well, if you know, what kind of camera are you using uh, on the shoots? I mean, it, it looks like a different camera than, than I, I'm aware of. In production. <laughs> We're, we're using a, uh, I, I don't remember what, what the model number is. We're using a Sony uh, 4K camera. Uh, okay, okay. But what the pictures you're seeing are, are actually stills from a Nikon. Oh yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know that. Uh, now this is gonna be, yeah, you're gonna have to comment on this because it doesn't seem like a question. In light of your, your initial statements about Tehar, I am immediately, uh, well, I think his attitude and approach to Hans Kung, whose obit we just just are reading today in the Washington Post, pushing the envelope. Do you have anything to add to that or <laughs> talk about that? I'm not. Well, that, that would require that we know more about Hans Kung than we do. We 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 have read the obituaries and we we do recognize that there is a uh, the Tayar was not not unique in being ahead of uh, the, the official church teaching at times. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, 
specifically, uh, we, we would, we would, there's much more that could be said about his, uh, his uh, attitude towards the church, but, um, but that would not reflect much on this uh, Hans King uh, right. um, comparison. Okay. Uh, also, do you know if Pope Francis, a Jesuit, and a scientist may have embraced uh, Tehar's teachings? Well, we, we do have a clue about that, because you might know that uh, Pope Francis wrote an encyclical called Laudato Si on the environment, and he cites Tehar in, an, in a uh, footnote, footnote 53, if you want to look it up. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> In, in, in which he, uh, he mentions that, uh, uh, that the past four popes have all embraced Teilhard, although it sounds a little like Galileo because he's a, uh, Pope Francis is right up front with him embracing Teilhard. I must, might also say that Pope Benedict XVI uh, called uh, Teilhard an ideal priest. Mm. Uh, and and I, if I may extend the answer to extend a, a common complaint is that Teilhard was uh, subject to a, what was called a monitum back in 1962, in which uh, Catholic uh, seminaries were asked not to allow their students to read Teilhard, um, and they, they thought his reading was, could, be, uh, could be problematic for people. Um, and the wonder is, does this objection still exist? Uh, and the answer is no, it doesn't. And part of the way we know that is, uh, is Pope Benedict's uh, uh, enthusiastic endorsement of, uh, of Teilhard. Plus, you were a seminarian and you were reading Teilhard. So <laughs> that's how I got started on this. <laughs> oh, <I see>. <laughs> oh, okay. There's a connection. <laughs> well, this is kind of related to uh, the question. Uh, while science was embracing a change of you of the world, how was uh, theology? evolving during Tehard's lifetime. Wow. It sounds like it wasn't really, but. <laughs> that, 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 that was exactly the problem. You see, uh, this is why the evolution was such an important aha to Tehard. At the time that Tehard was studying theology uh, and through all the way up through Pope Pius XII up, up into the 1960, um, the, the Catholic Church was living in a, uh, a pre-evolutionary uh, world, a static world, a world where there was one truth and it was, it was forever. Uh, and Teilhard's notion that everything is emerging um, was, was not well received uh, by the church. Now, it turns out that there was a whole movement in France of which he was a part uh, that was very influential in the Second Vatican Council. Uh, before the Second Vatican Council, the, the, uh, the Catholic Church uh, was, um, was not really open to the, to the notion uh, mm -hmm. that there were things to learn from, uh, from science uh, uh, and from, the, uh, uh, from evolution. You want to put him on that? Um, before we get too far, um, there's a question is how may people contribute to your, <laughs> to your efforts? I guess financially, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if we have a website, which is tayardproject.com. And when you go there, there's along the top, there's a, a place to click on donations. And there are a number of ways and we even have uh, tax deductible donations available. Um, so again, it's tayardproject.com. Uh, I don't know if I need to spell it. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> That'd be hard. Um, I mean, it's also, it seems- I think We might say that we'd be very grateful for any yes. contribution. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> um, because we're, we're, we're st still, struggling to the end and uh, every dollar sure. counts. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, one person, I read many uh, of Teilhard's books in my spiritual training. What motivated you two to do this documentary? Well, that's a, 
the, the short version of the long version. <laughs> the uh, short, <laughs> the short version. Um, I I was motivated uh, because in my distant past as a young Jesuit, um, I had read Teilhard, especially the Divine Milieu, uh, and then I more or less for, forgot that. Uh, later years, as we lived in Washington, uh, we met with people who, when they were learning were documentary filmmakers, would say you should do a film on Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and then we learned about Georgetown having all these resources. Uh, we neared the end of our career when it was less risky for us to uh, take a project that would might take a, a while to raise the funds. And we thought carefully of it and, and we knew it. But we were motivated by the fact that his ideas, I, I say in my private life that Teilhard gives me a God I can believe in. That's really what motivated us to do it. But that's not the television part. The television part is that it, it, it's very difficult to do a television show about ideas. And so we decided to do a television show on his life. And out of his life would emerge his ideas, the beginning and not in, in great detail, but that uh, then people would be maybe motivated to, uh, to pursue that. So our goal was to take a very deep but narrow uh, constituency who loved Teilhard and to make that broad, to, to, to broaden out to a very wide audience. And that's why we wanted to go the route of television. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one question is, is that, I mean, I don't know, Years ago, I mean, four centuries ago, um, the religious leaders, something the Jesuits thought that, like, you know, always looking, what are the messages from God? And it was always thought there was some thinking that the myth, the science was actually where, you know, God was sending messages to humans. I mean, science was, was the pathway. To, to you know to tell people that of uh, the message from God are you did Tehar think that think that way or at all well, yes but this this is an irony of course for for centuries the church was the leader in science science was a word you know, for a long time of meaning uh, knowledge uh, and uh, and the church uh, was there but, but the science they were pursuing was Newtonian science um, and uh, along comes the 20th century, and we now have uh, post-Darwin, and we're Einstein, Einstein is there, and we now have new idea of science. And the church was not bending, did not, did not easily bend towards the new science, mm. uh, towards the notion that there was change, that things change and are const constantly changing and, ev and evolving. I think I'm not, I think I'm wandering from the answer. <laughs> but, but so science, science is something the church used to be very interested in, but for some time now has resisted. And I think we are finally coming back just now to being more mm -hmm. open to science. Also, um, did Tehard ever cross paths with Thomas Merton? He Merton? Did not. What? not that we know of. Not that not we know, know of. of. Okay. Okay. We, we do, however, hear, constantly hear um, people talk about the two together because of their insights in, into engaging the world as part of their spirituality mm -hmm. is mutual. Uh, and um, same people who urge us to do a show on Teilhard have urged us to do a show on Merton. But of course, others have done very good shows on Merton already. Okay. Um, so I, I get the impression you're... you're yeah, actually, the production you're taping is, or are you filming this? Are you filming? Are, well, you, are you using videotape or using film? Well, see, or we, 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 started, we started actually as filmmakers using film. Uh, we came to terms with technology and uh, turned to tape on, in, in video. We're now using digital uh, right. now, uh, means. Uh, and it's actually, it's actually video, you might say. But, but it's all on files, but it's it's computer it's, files, it's right. video files. Right. Um, and we continue to use the word film because film basically is a generic term for creating something which is entertaining and, and moving images with sound. And, uh, and um, but but no, it's technically we are not shooting on film. Okay. <laughs>
Um, and will the documentary be telecast in the near future, or it that that's depends on your financing? Well, well that's it. the way that I put it is um, we have a year's work to do, uh, and that year will expand depending on how long it takes to get the money to do that mm -hmm. year of work. Um, we uh, have set targets in the past, and our target now is uh, going to take some time. When time when we finish it, to the time that PBS will put it on the air. Uh, we, we're now targeting uh, 2022, hopefully early in 2022, oh, okay. but it all depends on the income. Mm. And uh, somewhat of a technical question. Uh, what is color correction in filmmaking? Um, or is it now video, now digital video? No, no, actually, color correction in, in, in video is, is critical. You don't pay attention to it when when you're watching a show on television, you don't pay attention to the fact that there, you never see a broadcast show anymore that has not gone through a color correction process. So every, every time a camera shoots an, an image, it shoots on color and we kind of automatically think that's color. Um, but color has various tones. Um, and in addition to that, you can shade those tones, not only to make them, make it a smoother aesthetic image, but you can actually change the emotional tone of an image uh, by shading the color. And it's a very specialized and uh, an extremely important process if you want a really high quality show to, uh, to run it through color processing before you go to broadcast. Because I don't know if I'm right about this, but you're putting uh, shots next to each other that were shot at different times in different places. And yeah. so mm -hmm. you, you need to smooth that over so that right. they match. At the very least, right? Yeah. Or you, you may want to, yeah, we want to change the, the color for tone or whatever also, you, you know, it depends upon, yeah, the, the time of day too, depending upon it's the evening or it's, it's the afternoon or whatever, yeah. Color, yeah. color correction has become so sophisticated uh, in the digital process that the people we use to color correct at Henninger Video uh, can uh, specify particular parts of the, sh of, of the shot to color correct uh, so they can actually modify the, uh, the, the image itself to a certain right. extent. Right. Uh, how would Tehard deal with someone who espouses creationism? Um, you think <laughs> so it's gonna be a there's, there's, been, there's been a great deal written about this, and I would uh, uh, respond if you want to pursue this in detail that you look up the author John Haught, H A U G H T, who's written a great deal on that. Um, but uh, for my part, uh, the difference is that Teilhard's God is not the uh, creationist God, the creationist God is a third party God that is created and, um, and the um, Teilhard's God is the immanent God. He also transcendent, but is the immanent God in everything in the very process of evolution. Um, they may sound very much alike, uh, but there is a, there is a distinction uh, between uh, creationism as I understand it uh, and, the, uh, and the dynamic God of, of evolution. I would guess as a person, he would try to encounter that uh, individual, that he would perhaps try to explain. Uh, I mean, the, the critical part for Teilhard was he was a geologist and he knew just looking at the strata, uh, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. where they discovered Peking Man, I mean, you can just see how many layers of dirt there are for, for all these different generations of or hundreds of millions of years. And, uh, and so yeah, I'm sure he would be quite nice to them. He was a very charming, nice, intelligent person. Hmm. Well, it seems like, well, your opinion, I think I know the answer. It's like that the Chinese um, have much more respect uh, for Teilhard than people in the U.S. <laughs> well, and even than people in France. Um, <laughs> that, okay. 
one, one, one of the great ironies is that um, uh, France tears old stuff and uh, he doesn't, does not get a lot of attention. Um, in the United States, we find a tremendous interest in Tayar in various in different ways. Some people are very attracted to Tayar because of his spirituality, but others because of his inspiration of an ecological movement and others like him because of his synthesis of science and, and, mm. and faith. And uh, others, particularly now, are, are seeing him that they're now facts fixing on the word noosphere, the idea that there's a, a, a global brain. And, and since we've developed the internet and, and instant world communication and technology, and we're now to the point of uh, a transhumanist movement, that Tayar was one of the very first people to talk about transhumanism. Uh, oh, really? Oh. But although his transhumanism, uh, is quite different than, than a kind of a materialist transhumanism, uh, trying to get kind of physical per perfection for, for the human being. Um, but uh, people who are interested in uh, current evolution and AI uh, f can be very attracted to Tayar because he, he did not see that human species as we are now is the final product and we continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's interesting. Um, I think we're at the end of the questions. Uh, do you have a concluding statement? What do you, what do you like to say about Tehard and, and your work? Um, there, there are a couple of um, items we might mention, but uh, I'm sure that anybody who's watching would be happy to have a, a session or end early. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, I would say that um, the, uh, I think, well, I think I already mentioned this, that uh, we set out to do this because Tayar, uh, the, uh, the, the, we recognize a deep interest in Tayar. When we went to uh, uh, consult with uh, PBS before we began this program, making this, uh, they, they, they responded well to the story of Tayar, but they wanted to know who's ever going to watch it. Um, and so we uh, realized that we needed to spend more time really doing uh, kind of a, a discernment and a research on where the audience is for, for, for Tayar. Uh, and that's when we came up with the, these examples I just gave you of these different ways he, he affects different people. Um, we, um, we also, I, I was, when I went to film school, because I did that, um, when I went there, I expected to be a critic and because uh, I had performed uh, as, as a film reviewer before that. And I was, found myself very critical of films that didn't perform the way that I thought they should. By the time I finished film school, I was amazed that anyone ever finished a film. <laughs> They're so complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and above all, I discovered that it, to make a film requires many, many skills, many, many people uh, working together. And we have been very, very fortunate in this production to find uh, people, sometimes by serendipity, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. we have, we've been working with wonderful people and wonder, uh, that have wonderful skills. Uh, and um, we count on that to bring this uh, to a, a very happy conclusion. And, and if people are uh, more interested, um, if you go to our tayardproject.com, uh, yeah, tayardproject.com, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. And we also have a Facebook page called the Tayard Project that you can like and we do posts there. And there's an even uh, better Facebook page just called Tayard de Chardin that people can sign up for where they have wonderful, the people on that page have wonderful discussions all the time about Tayard and his ideas. Um, so we recommend that. Plus many books, Ursula King uh, is a, a, a British uh, academic who has written probably the best biography about uh, Teilhard in English. It's called Spirit of Fire. Mm. And that not only tells about his life, but also mm -hmm. goes into great detail on his, uh, his vision. 
So, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you. For, oh, for, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for, for sharing this with us. And I think we're looking forward to the you. film and I hope the, this generated a lot of interest, maybe even some financial interest. <laughs> <laughs>